The Seattle band Harvey Danger would rise to prominence in the late 90s thanks to their hit Flagpole Sitta. Rolling Stone would name the song as one of their 25 top songs of the 90s, but frontman Sean Nelson would be quoted as telling one interviewer, we went from being completely anonymous to totally overexposed in a month. It begs the question, whatever happened to Harvey Danger? Formed in Seattle during the height of grunge in 1993, Harvey Danger started out as a joke. The band would be formed by the University of Washington students guitarist Jeff Lynn and bassist Aaron Huffman. The pair had never learned to play guitar or bass, but they would learn from playing music and from jamming with one another. They would soon add frontman Sean Nelson and drummer Evan Salt, who also attended the University of Washington. The quartet soon became roommates and began jamming on Nirvana and Mudhoney covers at college parties. Aside from playing music and being students, they also worked for the college student newspaper called The Daily. Rumors around the time of the band's first album coming out claimed they got their name from soccer player Timmy Harvey or their nickname from former Major League Baseball player Harmon Kilbrew, when in actuality Harvey Danger's name originated from a graffiti character that was drawn on the wall at the University of Washington. It was during the early years of the band that the members also worked for other Seattle publications, with the Seattle Times writing about the group and I quote, Nelson was until recently an editor at The Stranger, where bassist Aaron Huffman worked in production. Salt was an assistant director of The Rocket, and guitarist Jeff Lynn was the editor of The International Examiner. With that on top of their time at The Daily, the band members have some experience with the business of rock and roll and are determined to avoid its pitfalls, they write. Salt would tell the AV Club what the band's early days were like in 1993, saying, None of us walked around in big leather jackets. We weren't that world. With Nelson adding, We were this very hermetic group. We weren't really part of the Seattle scene. We really weren't part of any community. The band would spend its first five years together playing house parties and club shows around the city. The band would put together their first album, Where Have All the Merrymakers Gone, on local label, the Arena Rock Recording Company. The label was run by a man named Greg Glover, who also happened to be an intern at major label London Slash Records. Nelson would tell the AV Club, Greg wasn't the very first person who ever believed in us, but he was the first person who was ever willing to put his money and his time on the line to work with us. The band's debut album would be made for only $3,000 and had an initial pressing of 1,000 copies. Despite hailing from Seattle, the band's sound drew more comparisons to alternative rock pioneers Weezer and The Replacements in addition to Ben Folds 5 and The Posies. Harvey Danger's lyrics intertwined troubled relationships with cynicism and paranoia. That's not to say the music scene in Seattle didn't inspire the band lyrically. Their breakout song on their debut record Flagpole Sitter was written about Seattle's alternative music scene becoming co-opted and commodified. The AV Club perfectly summarized the song saying, Flagpole set of finds Harvey Danger exploring the tension between being both a cultural observer and a participant. When you're self-aware enough to notice how the underground is being co-opted, but yet simultaneously caught up and horrified by this commodification. Drummer Evan Salt would tell the AV Club how the song captured what the early 90s in Seattle felt like saying, I think it's really a true version of what it felt like to be alive, at least in Seattle, when we actually wrote it. The ironic remove and innate suspicion of both the mainstream culture and the alternative culture and the yearning to be part of something, but not being able to get around the suspicion and the self-loathing, he'd say. Frontman Sean Nelson would end up working across the street from a local Seattle DJ named Marco Collins, who worked for the rock station KNDD. They would end up bumping into one another with Nelson telling the AV Club, I was exactly the kind of person who always had copies of our record in my backpack. Though it was an embarrassing, tacky move, I believed in our band and I was ambitious at the time, so I was like, well, what the hell? What could I lose? What's the worst that could happen? Lucky for the band, Colin started playing Flagpole Sitta and the impact was immediate as within several weeks the song was being played in other major markets. Salt would tell the AV Club, we started getting calls from friends around the country like in Florida, what is going on, I just heard your song on the radio and then I heard it again and the DJ played it five times in a row and said it was his new favorite song, what's happening he would say. Nelson, meanwhile, would tell Stereo Gum, the thing I remember is the one thing I didn't have was the chorus. The chorus for most of the first year we had the song that we were playing, it was just the backing vocals bit, which I always thought of it as very much in tune with the Turtles or something. But we had recorded the song and I thought, well, there needs to be words in the chorus. Well, it just can't be this. So I went desperately flailing through my notebook and I found the line, I'm not sick, but I'm not well, which was from another song. Then I basically just sang it and made up other words on the mic. In a separate interview with Rolling Stone, he'd say, I wish I had the effing sense to change the name of the song. I'm not sick, but I'm not well is what everybody else calls it. If I had done that, we'd be having this conversation on my yacht. 
According to Billboard magazine, it would be the record label Slash London, who hadn't even signed the band yet, who sent the group's debut album to the Los Angeles station K-Rock, who soon added Flagpole Sitter to the rotation. The success of Flagpole Sitter would result in a bidding war for major labels to sign the band, with Harvey Danger opting to stay close to home signing with Slash London Records. Nelson would tell Billboard shortly after the signing, saying, Not bad for a batch of demos. The songs are good, but they are demos. They're not fully fleshed out sonically or otherwise. Slash London would end up reissuing the band's debut album a year later in 1998. But for the band's new label, they were playing catch-up. While Flagpole Sitter was getting national airplay, they had a short period of time to build the band's identity. Billboard would interview Wayne Pagini, who was the product manager in the United States for their label, who was quoted as saying, When the record hit the streets, there was some concern that we weren't going to catch up. There were stock shortages, the press didn't have the lead time it needed, we didn't have a video ready, and here we are six or seven weeks in tremendous rotation in certain markets. Add to that that the title of the track Flagpole Sitta wasn't synonymous with the song, since the title isn't in the lyrics. The label had to ship out store place cards that tied the name of the song to the group's name. But by June of 1998, the label was finally able to catch up and Pagini would go on to reveal that people were finally becoming familiar with the name of the band, adding that around June things started to click when we were getting enough detection at Modern Rock where people were asking for the band by the name instead of going into stores and humming the chorus to clerks. The label finally also put together a video for Flagpole Sitta after the first one was rejected by the band. Harvey Danger though was a little weary of signing with the major label as a lot of their favorite bands were indie groups. Bassist Aaron Huffman would tell the LA Times in 1998, We were terrified after London signed us. Sure, we were excited, but we were a little scared too. We've seen it a lot. Bands get signed to a major, put out an album, and then poof, they're gone. But we're okay about it now. We're focused on the quality of the songs and continuing to write the same way we always have. We never planned on commercial success, and I think anyone who does is a fool. The band would soon start getting major touring offers and playing festivals, but the novelty wore off quickly. Salt recalled the band's frustration telling the AV Club, it felt like we just kind of missed our audience, you know. We were writing to our peers who were 24 years old and into pavement and guided by voices. We felt like we've never been cool before and now we're not cool except the 13 year olds who heard us on the radio. No wonder they don't recognize the irony or the sarcasm in the song. The group's debut album would go gold moving over half a million copies, but not everyone was happy with the band's success. Harvey Danger would admit that some major music publications suspected the band were fabrications of the record label. Sean Nelson would tell Alt Press, his former employer, that he was still submitting pieces a month or so before the album came out, saying, There was some backlash locally in Seattle. The fundamental difference is between a little record you sort of find out about, then there's the thing where I'm being completely bombarded by this effing song. Flakepole said it wasn't just played a lot, it was massively played. We were getting reports that in Atlanta they played it three times in a row every day at 5 o'clock or something like that. I'm grateful ultimately, but the radio programmers went apeshit with that song. Incessant radio play makes it so the half-life of the song being something you discover, it cuts it so short, he'd say. Nelson would tell the AV Club how the song was so misunderstood, saying, And what we didn't realize, or what I didn't realize, because I wrote the words, was to what extent I lived in this sort of weird culturally utopian bubble here in Seattle. When we went out into the world and toured around, it became clear that people were kind of just taking it at face value. The best example I can give you is that literally hundreds of kids came up to me and said, I got my tongue pierced because of that song. And they would show me and I sort of thought, well, that's not my intention. I wasn't trying to give a boost to the tongue piercing industry. I just thought that the idea in the song was that people are letting these sort of outward signifiers stand in for real kinds of rebellion. And isn't that silly, he'd ask. Flagpole said it would gain a wider audience when it was licensed for the Katie Holmes movie Disturbing Behavior and the teen comedy American Pie. But the band did turn down some licensing opportunities, including having the song being the theme track for the Jimmy Kimmel and Adam Carolla program, The Man Show. The song would end up peaking at number 38 on the US Billboard Hot 100 Airplay charts and number 3 on the Billboard Modern Rock Tracks chart. 